That was I Was a Punk Before You Were Born by Ollie Stench's band, The Ed Gein Fan Club. On September 27th of this year, Light Gray Art Lab invited Ollie to give a talk about punk rock, specifically how he defines punk rock as a movement, the culture and worldview that created it, and how it has changed the world since. The lecture coincided with the Expletive Poster Show, which was a collection of typographic posters that made ugly words beautiful through illustration and design. We thought the rebellious nature of some of the work in the show was pretty in line with the spirit of punk rock, so we called local expert Ollie to come in and give a lecture on the subject. Um, Ollie's been an active participant in the punk rock scene for the last 30 years and is incredibly knowledgeable. He's very opinionated, and he's pretty much an expert in everything that surrounds the topic. Uh, we hope you enjoy this lecture. Ollie's a passionate guy, and it was a lot of fun to have him in the gallery to give this talk. Uh, my name's Ollie Stench. Uh, I have been into punk rock and new wave, which at the time was the same thing, uh, since, since 1978. Um, I was 10 years old. I heard the B-52s, and uh, that was it. Game over. Uh, in the ensuing years, I've spent, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on records and books and magazines and crap like that. Um, I played in bands, uh, Iron Fist, Egging Fan Club, The Subversives. Uh, the Subversives is probably the most popular one. We had records out uh, in the States and in Europe. Uh, had a band called The Hostages that is... Uh, we have some, some members of The Hostages here tonight. Um, I did a radio show on KFAI called uh, Radio Riot for six years that was punk rock and hardcore. Uh, me and a guy named Felix Havoc co-hosted that. Um, I did a TV show called Drinking with Ian that had nothing to do with punk rock, uh, but uh, that was just... People come up to me, hey, are you Ollie Stench? And I say, sometimes. Uh, I know you. Okay, fine. Yeah, I went down to see your band. I saw you on TV, whatever. Cool. Hey, thanks. Buy me a beer. All right, you're not going to buy me a beer? Fuck off. Um... I'm going to get into it later, but there's two things, two misconceptions about punk rock that I absolutely fucking hate, and I will get into those. And when I get into one of them, the first one, uh, I actually got into a screaming argument at Grumpy's last night out on the patio about this. Uh, so tonight, I also, this is the first time I've ever done anything like this. Um, I'm very comfortable in front of a crowd, but I've never actually like given a speech or a lecture or anything. Um, but as you guys know me, I'm very easy, easy to get started. <laughs> um, I was asked to do this about two months ago and I was trying to figure out what to do because they just asked to have someone come in and talk about punk rock. And that's such a wide subject matter that, uh, it's, I, I didn't know where to begin. And then they were telling me that the, the theme of the, the whole uh, exhibition was uh, expletives and things like that. And I thought, well, I could talk about all the obnoxious punk rock bands, but none of you guys would know who I was talking about. And I thought that was kind of a waste of time. So what I figured is the, the biggest th question I get asked is how and why did punk rock start? So that's what tonight is going to be. It's, it's going to be about the, the societal conditions that allowed punk rock to happen. And so we're going to go back to 1974, and the popular bands at the time were bands like the Carpenters and Seals and Crofts. And if you guys don't know these bands, look them up on YouTube and... <laughs> They're all shit, boring, just wimpy crap. But then I hear someone like Bonavar or uh, The Tallest Men on Earth, and it's just fucking seals and cross all over again. I might as well listen to Poco. Um, but uh, the, the kids who were to start the punk rock scene... Uh, had grown up with bands like the Rolling Stones and the Kinks and the Yardbirds and, um, you know, 
some of the glam bands like you know Brownsville Station and the Suite, um, and all these like really high energy, exciting, fun bands. And by about 74, 75, those bands didn't exist. That style of music didn't exist. You couldn't hear it on the radio. Uh, the records were no longer in print. Um, and you were just forced to listen to the Marshall Tucker Band, um, which, again, if, if you don't know them, look them up, and you'll hate me forever because you'll never be able to unhear that stuff. Um, TV and movies was, was also a big thing, um, and that's something that not a lot of histories of punk rock will talk about. But, you know, if you think in 1977, Three's Company started, and the whole premise of Three's Company was this guy was living with two women and how, like, just mind-blowing that was. He had to pretend that he was gay in order to get away with living with these two women. Um, you know, and the portrayal of women in, like, you know, Kojak or Barney Miller or, or whatever, um, society was still really repressed, and it's, it's hard to remember how bad it was back then, and that all added to the frustration that the younger generation was having. Um, you know, and there was, there was also, now it's popular, but the whole Yacht Rock thing, I mean, that was, you know, Boz Skaggs was the enemy. Uh, Hall & Oates was the enemy. Um, all that kind of just, like, middle-of-the-road, boring, pussy music uh, was just not cutting it, especially to these kids that had grown up with their older brothers listening to this really exciting, uh, you know, 60s rock and roll. And so by about late 74, a couple things happened. Um, all of the, the bands that had been exciting, the, the Stones and the Kinks and, and those bands, the Faces, had all become mega rich stars and totally out of touch with their roots and their fan base, their original fan base. And kids got frustrated with that. They, uh, they saw through the artifice, uh, you know, Rod Stewart hanging out with uh, uh, the royal, royal family and everything wasn't representative of what they had been, uh, you know, 10 years earlier. Another thing that happened in the mid-70s, and this is something that, that I haven't seen documented anywhere, uh, but really led to the explosion of punk rock, was the availability of cheap instruments. You know, prior to the, the mid-70s, you could only buy, you know, Gibson Fender or Rickenbacker guitars that were made in America and at the time were the equivalent of $3,000. And uh, is that better? Yeah. All right. Uh, we're all friends here. Uh, um, so in the, in the 70s, mid-70s, uh, you started getting cheap guitars, cheap amplifiers, cheap drums from Asia, you know, Japan, Singapore, Korea. And now you could buy a guitar for the equivalent of 100 bucks, 200 bucks, And uh, so that put the accessibility in the hands of the average person. You didn't have to be already a rich rock star to buy musical equipment. And this is, this is worldwide. It's not just in America. It's not just in, in uh, Europe. You know, Japan, China, uh, Australia, New Zealand, they were all getting access to equipment that even five years previous they just wouldn't have had the means to buy. So, also, and this is, this is something for a whole other discussion, but uh, keep in mind that concurrent with punk rock starting in the mid-70s, and in a second, I'm going to draw some definite lines in the sand, uh, but concurrent with that, you had disco, and you had the, the absolute beginnings of hip-hop. And, like I say, that's, I mean, I could do a whole five hours on disco and ten hours on, on hip-hop and how it's all the same attitude and the same, the same uh, 
the same beginnings, just going off in separate directions. But we're talking about punk rock, and for the, the sake of clarity for tonight, punk rock, the way I see it, is an attitude, it's a musical style, and it's uh, an image. You need all three to be considered punk rock in the context of what I'm going to be talking about. And, you know, I remember seeing an interview with Alice Cooper in, like, 1977, and he, he said, yeah, I'm, I'm the grandfather of punk rock. And no, you're not. You may have the attitude. You didn't have the sound. You didn't have the look. Whereas, you know, The Clash, a couple years later, had the look, the sound, and the attitude. So that's the package. That's what made punk rock. And to this day... You know, I still believe that you have to have all three uh, for it to be classified as capital P punk, capital R rock. Um, conventional history tells you that, depending on who you talk to, they say punk rock either started with the Ramones in New York City or it started with the Sex Pistols in, in London. Yes and no. That gets to the second thing that I fucking hate that I'll get into later. Uh, but for sake of drawing lines in the sand and giving a definite starting point, um, we'll start in New York. I could start anywhere else, but I had to start somewhere. We'll start in New York. 1972, you had the New York Dolls. And when they were around they weren't that popular. They're much more popular now in retrospect than they ever were when they were uh, together. But they, in 1973, went to London, appeared on television on a TV show called The Old Grey Whistle Test, and that set off a lot of kids who saw it. They saw this completely inept band who, in the context of uh, the time, couldn't play their instruments. They looked like a bunch of drugged-out drag queens, and uh, they just didn't give a flying fuck whether they won fans or not. That then inspired a lot of the London scene, and I'll get to that later. So back in New York... Mid-70s, 74, 75, you had the Ramones just starting out. You had uh, a band called the Dictators that actually preceded the Ramones. And these are all bands that had the look, the sound, and the attitude. Um, and none of these bands were popular. They, you know, a good show for the Dictators in 1975 would be to playing to 100 people. And, you know, that would fill a room this size. They're not playing, you know, uh, uh, Wembley Stadium. They're not playing the Target Center. They're playing a place like the Entry, and it's half full. So at the time, it just, it was a really, really small scene. In New York, the average age, and this is some generalizations that I'm going to be making too, but the, the average age of the New York punk scene was about 25, 26 years old. They tended to be misfits who moved to New York from somewhere else in order to find somewhere where they fit. Um, one of the things I, I thought about talking about was uh, there were two, two bands directly... Uh, before punk rock, punk rock in quotes, um, television and the Patti Smith group. Um, they were very influential, but neither band had the sound. So they had the attitude and the look. They didn't have the sound. And like I say, I needed to draw a line somewhere. I'm not including them. If you want to read on the history of, of television or Patti Smith, go ahead. Uh, you know, Velvet Underground too. The, it depends on how far back you want to trace it. 
But there are other bands going on in 74, 75 in New York. Um, Wayne County, who would move to England and start Wayne County in the electric chairs and then become Jane County. Um, Wayne County had a band called Queen Elizabeth that was playing uh, in 74, 75, and uh, still not drawing any crowds. The Ramones started to build an audience at CBGB's, and they were the first band to really coalesce a core group of people into coming to see them. And that's why they're generally considered, to Americans, the first punk rock band. Um, by 76, they had an album out. They went and toured England. All the kids who had seen the New York Dolls a couple years earlier in England on TV went to see the Ramones because they saw something similar. And those shows in London really touched off the British scene. Again, back to New York, um, you had, uh, you know, by about 76, 77, you already had some bands jumping on the bandwagon. Uh, the Dead Boys have moved from uh, Ohio to New York uh, because they saw something similar going on. Um, you had uh, the Talking Heads, again, not uh, stylistically punk rock, but they are of the CBGB scene. They moved from, I think, Connecticut or something like that. Uh, I was never a fan, so I don't know. Um, but uh, by definitely by 78, you had the bandwagon jumpers and the, the bands who had glommed on to certain aspects. They were already using the Ramones as a template and then just said, okay, this is what we're supposed to do, wear leather jackets, put holes in our jeans, and play power chords and sing about being bored. And that's cool because that's basically what punk rock became, and that's what it was by the time I got into it, and, and uh, that's, that's what I liked about it. So uh, from New York... Uh, you know, the CBGB's was the, the big club, and I don't know if any of you have been there. I played there once, and it is slightly larger than the 7th Street entry. It's this club that has this massive reputation, but it, it was uh, narrower than this room that we're in now, and probably about another 30 feet longer, and that's it. Um, so when you hear about bands packing CBGBs, they were packing it out with 200 people. You know, and then they'd start doing two shows a night so they could get 500 people in there and get, you know, two bucks a head. Uh, so it wasn't as big uh, population-wise as you're led to believe by watching some of these documentaries or reading some of these books. It was a very small insular scene, and it never really exploded the way it did in England. So I keep talking about England. And if you ask anyone, any, any punk rock fan outside of America, they're going to say that punk rock started in London in 1975 with the Sex Pistols. And in a way, it did, because they had the look, the sound, and the attitude. Uh, there were precursors. Uh, the pub rock scene, which, which happened directly before punk rock, and was influential um, in that these pub rock bands were called pub rock bands because they would play in pubs. They would play in bars. At the time, that was unheard of. You, there wasn't a lot of live music in bars anywhere. Um, and these bands like Dr. Feelgood and Eddie and the Hot Rods and uh, Ducks Deluxe and uh, Bees Make Honey, they in London would find sympathetic bar owners who had like a hall upstairs and rent it out and put on these concerts, kind of like uh, the Little Rascals. You know, we have a bar and let's put on a show. Yeah. Um, 
And in the case of, I forget the name of the club, but uh, Joe Strummer had a band called the 101ers before the clash. They started a club called the Charlie Pig Dog Club. That's what it was called, on Elgin Avenue. And they actually had a dog that was the resident uh, pet of the club. So that was their Petey. Uh, some of you get that. Um, so the pub rock bands opened the doors to having access to stages in London and in the, in the surrounding areas too, um, and the smaller cities, Manchester, uh, Leeds, Yorkshire, things like that. Uh, but it really wasn't until the Sex Pistols got together that the frustration was able to be uh, coalesced into one cohesive unit. And I can get into the history of the Sex Pistols, and that could be another 12-hour talk, and I won't get into that. There's a lot of documentation uh, about them. But they were a couple frustrated kids who uh, missed the excitement of seeing uh, the Faces and the Kinks and uh, a bunch of other bands that no one's heard of, uh, Mott the Hoople, the Sharks, bands like that. Um, and Steve Jones, the guitar player of the Sex Pistols, uh, as a hobby, was a thief. He would uh, steal, he would break into musicians' houses and steal their equipment. Uh, there was a very famous story that he tells, and I don't know if it's ever been actually verified, but he he tells the story of breaking into Wembley Auditorium uh, and stealing all of the mics from David Bowie, and breaking into Brian May from Queen's house and stealing all of his guitars. I don't know if that's ever been substantiated, but that's the story, and as usual, the story is usually better than reality. But so, Steve Jones and Paul Cook... Uh, the drummer, had all this equipment. They had quit school. They were looking for something to do, and they said, well, let's just learn how to play this stuff. At at that time, again, 74, general consensus was you had to be a proficient musician to make music. You had to have been playing guitar for 12 years and know your chromatic minor arpeggiated scales uh, well enough to play them in your sleep, like Spencer... (laughs) Uh, and seeing the Dolls on TV and seeing the Ramones uh, when they played exploded that myth. Because like I said, these, the, the Dolls and the Ramones were not considered proficient musicians. They were not considered uh, Jethro Tull. The, they were considered extremely amateurish, and that kind of green-lighted it it for the kids to say, hey, I don't have to take lessons for 12 years. I can get up, I can learn three chords and write a song and get up on a stage and do it. And it became attitude over ability. And that's, personally, that's the main thing I got out of punk rock, attitude over ability. If you've got the balls to get up and do something, then you just do it, whether you think you're good enough or not. Uh, Tonight is a perfect example. (laughs) I don't know what the fuck I'm doing, but, you know, uh, I'm doing it. Who cares? So the thing about the London scene is it was, in, in musical terms, it was a generation younger than the New York scene. Remember, the New York scene was, was people in their mid-20s, 24, 25, 26, 27. In England, they were all 18, 19, 20. Joe Strummer was 24 when he joined the Clash, and he was considered a, an old man at the time and actually lied about his age because he was three years older than the other guys in the band. Um, and the the... The Ramones and the, and the Dolls gave the okay to get up there and do it, whether you could play or not. And uh, that just kind of let the floodgates go. 
there were all these frustrated kids that had no prospect of a job. The school system in England basically was churning you out to work in a factory or a bank, and your only options at the time were to get out as a get out of that cycle either by playing sports or by playing music. I'm not a sports fan. I don't know how many frustrated kids became soccer stars, uh, and I don't pretend to know that, and I don't even care. But you had the the non-athletic kids saw punk rock as an escape from the world that they just a couple years earlier were basically forced to, to contend with. Um, so the Sex Pistols played their first gig in November of 75, and uh, we need to, to keep that in mind because the, the Ramones didn't play in England until 76. So if people say that the Ramones started punk rock, no, they didn't because, the, you know, the Pistols were playing in 75. The Clash and the Damned were playing in very early 76 before the Ramones... Uh, influence could be heard over there. And you have to remember, too, that at that time there was no internet, there was no email, there was no file sharing, and there wasn't even really good record distribution. So what was going on in New York didn't really affect what was going on in London. Um, it, It happened kind of autonomously. Then when the Ramones came over and played... Everyone was like, okay, now I I have something to actually identify this to, and it exploded. And in London, it exploded, literally exploded overnight. Um, The Sex Pistols played a couple shows. Uh, They went on a daytime talk show um, and swore on live TV and caused the biggest uproar England had seen since uh, Hitler started bombing. And I like to think of it as it was just a slow news day uh, that, hey, this this band swore on TV. And it wasn't even like national TV. It was local. It was was like if a band went up to St. Cloud and went on the the St. Cloud local news and called the anchor a, a... a fuckhead or whatever. Um, so it, it was very much a slow news day, but the the economic and socioeconomic situation in England at the time needed something to blame for all of the unemployment, all of the shit that was going on. And here's this band, they swear on TV, okay, they're instantly public enemy number one. And that backfired in that the next day every newspaper had a headline about this and now every disgruntled kid said, oh, I feel like I feel that way. I'm now punk rock. And you had kids going out and cutting their hair and tearing up their clothes and wearing garbage bags uh, overnight. And it was dangerous, and this is you know something I was trying to explain uh, to someone the other day. There was a sense of danger. It, it was not safe like it is now to go out with even uh, you know non bell bottom jeans. You know if you had if you had straight leg jeans and a and a leather jacket, not even like a, a motorcycle jacket, just a, a leather jacket and straight jeans you were immediately a target for, for physical uh, abuse. Um, you know, and, and that happened everywhere. I mean, I remember getting chased. I remember getting my ass kicked in 1984 because I was punk rock. Uh, so we're going to get into, I mentioned the two things about, two misconceptions about punk rock that I hate. One of them I titled... When I wrote up my uh, my outline yesterday, you can't read it, but this right here says Dick Hebdige is a fucking ass. Uh, Dick Hebdige in 1980 wrote a book called Subculture: The Meaning of Style, and 
this is what I got in the argument at Grumpy's over last night. Um, in my opinion, this guy Dick Hebdige was a so, uh, social anthropologist and wrote this book, you know, not thick, but 140 pages about the meaning of punk rock style. And he would spend eight pages trying to explain the uh, societal significance of Johnny Rotten from the Sex Pistols wearing a safety pin on his sweater. And he goes into detail about how that was subverting the, the mainstream culture and, and all this stuff, and that's bullshit. Because Johnny Rotten had a sweater that was falling apart, and he didn't have money to buy a new sweater, so he got a safety pin and he pinned his sleeve back up. Um, the first misconception I just fucking despise is that there was this huge underlying meaning in punk rock. There wasn't. Um, especially in London, where image was more important than it was in America. In London, the very beginning of the scene, the fashion was a holdover from glam rock. And glam rock was Gary Glitter, T-Rex, uh, David Bowie, things like that. Kids like to dress up um, and... England has always been more fashion conscious than America. Um, and the kids there, they like to dress up. They had, you know, all these, these bell-bottom pants that they had their moms take in because they didn't like bell-bottoms. Um, and they didn't want to be associated with hippies and everything. Um, but there was no deep sociological meaning behind any, any of that. Um, they... They didn't want to be seen as part of normal society, so they dressed in a way that set them apart, but they didn't reference, uh, you know, Voltaire or any of these poets or anything that intellectuals wanted to ascribe to why punk rock was happening. Punk rock was happening because kids were bored. They were sick of the shit that their parents and their older brothers and sisters were listening to, and they wanted something of their own. Um, if you want to read more meaning into it, you can, but you are reading stuff in that doesn't exist. So uh, the argument I got into last night was the, the woman I was uh, arguing with actually uses Dick Hebdige's book in a uh, sociology class that she teaches. And uh, we got into a huge argument about uh, whether the author knew what he was talking about or not. And uh, she agreed that we disagree. She's wrong. I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> That's another thing about punk rock. Gives you confidence. <laughs> Stand up for your beliefs. Um, so, yeah, if... if you guys decide to, to, to pursue this any further on your own. Just keep in mind, there are a bunch of books out there that try to over-intellectualize punk rock. Stuff like that made by kids in their teens and early 20s. When I was that age, none of my friends would sit around and pontificate about how we could, uh, you know take the influence of Camus and project it on society in general. We wanted to be snot-nosed little kids and shock old ladies. And that's pretty much what it was. And anyone who tells you different is just trying to over-intellectualize it and make it sound more important than it really was. So the other thing that really gets up my ass about punk rock, the, the other misconception, is that it began in New York or it began in London. That's bullshit. Um, it happened concurrently worldwide. You know, popular culture in Australia in the 70s was just as shitty as popular culture in Finland, as in Ireland, as in Idaho, as in Canada. 
it was pretty vacuous, pretty vapid. And the kids who were looking for excitement weren't finding it. And so, and this was happening worldwide. And again, the availability of cheap instruments really plays a big part in why bands formed, why kids thought they could start bands, because they could now afford a guitar or a set of drums or a cheap keyboard or whatever. Um, so in, you know, again, general consensus, the Ramones started in 74, 75, the Dictators started in 74, 75, the Sex Pistols started in 75, but in Australia you had the Saints that were, you know, they started in like 73, they were, they were making recordings in their garage by 74, and they're, they're halfway around the world. They have no idea that the Ramones exist. They have no idea that the Damned exist. They're just doing it because they wanted to hear exciting music, um, and there was no one providing that. Radio Birdman in uh, England in 75, 76, same thing. Um, uh, the Dum Dum Boys in New Zealand, uh, you know, here in Minnesota, we tend to think of Australia and New Zealand as basically the same country. They're actually four hours apart by plane rides, so they're, you know, they're thousands of miles apart and completely different cultures. But yet, you have bands in in the mid '70s and definitely by '76, uh, starting in New Zealand. You had even in 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 uh, Minneapolis here, we had a band called the Suicide Commandos that started in 1974, uh, and they didn't know about the Ramones. They didn't know about Rocket from the Tombs in Cleveland. They didn't know about the Saints in Sydney. Um, you know, this band Crime in San Francisco, they're considered considered San Francisco's first punk rock band. They're, they put out their own single in mid-1976. Uh, they had no idea what was going on in other parts of the country or the world. Um, and so it really was a global phenomenon that wasn't because there was no internet there was no email they weren't influenced by anyone else but if you look at it they all kind of came to the same idea the same conclusion at the same time with regards to style and image attitude and musical style and it's really funny when you think about it that uh you know in switzerland uh, Dieter Meyer, who would later start this band, this electro band called Yellow, uh, he was the son of a multimillionaire and basically didn't have to work a day in his life. In 1977, he puts out a punk rock single because if he wanted to, and he had the means to do it, he had the access to to the money to finance it. But you know, he's in Switzerland doing that, and, uh, you know, bands in Spain are doing it, and bands in Canada. You know, you had DOA in Vancouver. You had, uh, um, I'm blanking on the name, the Vile Tones in Toronto, all doing the same thing. And, you know, basically uh, doing this aggressive music with a fuck you attitude and it was just worldwide. It, it, and it, it was at a time where they could not have been influenced by any other bands, uh, except for the bands that they grew up with, you know, the, the, the more radical 60s bands, um, you know, the, like, uh, you know, the, the Seeds and Count Five and bands like that. But... Uh, so if anyone ever, ever tries to tell you that punk rock started in New York or punk rock started in L.A. or punk rock started in London, they're full of shit, too. Um, and that, that's something that I'm really passionate about. And it never gets mentioned in any of the histories that you see or read about punk rock. It was a worldwide phenomenon that happened at the same time without the influence of each scene uh, knowing about each other. Was there a reason for the phenomenon, a thing that happened to spur this large change? Um, yes. The, the, the question is, was there something specific that made this happen worldwide? Um, and 
just the the boredom with the status quo, um, wanting to be individual, wanting to set yourself apart from the older generation. Um, that's one thing too that I think is is lacking these days. There isn't really a generation gap anymore. Um, you know, I know I have friends who are parents and even grandparents that listen to the same music as their kids. Their kids listen to the same music as their parents. And that was something that, that just did not happen up until about 15 years ago. Um, and so one of the big reasons that punk rock happened worldwide is the younger generation, they were getting a taste of autonomy. They were getting it, you know, they were being shown glimpses of rebellion um, in popular culture and that generation then just were the first to take it and run with it and and say fuck you to the older generation and do their own thing and very purposely set themselves apart um, from their parents from their older siblings and from straight society in general um, I assume that pretty much everyone here uh, at one point has not really felt uh, that they were part of mainstream culture um, because it's an art gallery and we're talking about punk rock. I assume that we all kind of have felt like we're outsiders. And for us, it's it's really hard to understand mainstream mentality uh, that, you know, think of everyone that you went to school with that were the, the popular kids they were striving to be mainstream. They were tr- striving to be part of the in crowd. And punk rock allowed an escape from that mentality, and it, it allowed a place to go to for all of the misfits and the outsiders to uh, gather around. That makes sense. It just seemed like there was something viral about it, you know? Well, it, it, it was viral before there was viral. Um, and... It, that's 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 something that I haven't quite figured out yet. Um, okay, can I tack onto that question? You've mentioned um, a lot of bands I've never heard of um, from like more remote parts of the world. Having never heard those bands myself, can you tell me were they singing about like the same subjects that the more well-known bands at the time were singing about, or were they singing other things like love songs or something? Um, the the question was the were all of the bands singing? Well, the majority of the bands singing about the same thing. Yes and no. Um, what's really funny, if you listen to a lot of uh, early punk from non-English speaking countries, most of them are singing in English. Uh, there were very few bands that were singing in their native tongue. Um, on my playlist here, I have one song uh, by a band called Ebba Grown that uh, I believe are Finnish, uh, and they're singing in Finn. But... Uh, A lot of these bands were singing about boredom and frustration, uh, about not wanting to be part of mainstream society, but there were also love songs um, in the traditional sense and in the the non-traditional sense. Um, A good non-traditional love song would be Orgasmatic by the Buzzcocks, a song about masturbation. Um, But, you know, then there, there were... This is another area that I could spend hours talking about, which are the the bandwagon jumpers. And a lot of the bandwagon jumpers were frustrated musicians from the pre-punk scene that then jumped onto the punk rock bandwagon in order to get noticed. Those bands, because their roots were in more middle-of-the-road Bands, they would sing traditional love songs with like a buzzsaw guitar, um, and but the, the the overall lyrical content of early punk rock was uh, boredom, frustration, um, wanting to set yourself apart from mainstream society. Um, and then after that, then sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Um, so you know, in the in the grand scheme, 
lyrically the the early punk bands worldwide were trying to be a little more not deep but a, a, just a a little bit different than Ted Nugent singing Wang Dang Sweet Poon Tang. Um, they they wanted to put a little more into it. But then again, there were some of those bands that were just out to piss people off and to be as obnoxious as possible. I mean, there was a band in England called the Pork Dukes who uh, had songs like Telephone Masturbator and Bend and Flush. Um, you know, I really don't think that you would hear Elton John singing Bend and Flush in public <laughs> at the time. Um, but, uh, yeah, generally the, the sense was... Uh, frustration with the way society was in general. And that manifested itself a million different ways. Does that answer your question? Specifically these bands from remote places like New Zealand or, or you know, far away. Um, they've never heard of what was going on in New York and England, um, but they were still singing about the same types of feelings and subjects? Yes. They, yes, the bands, the bands in New Zealand uh, were singing... Either obnoxious lyrics just to piss people off and to to create that generation gap, like bands everywhere else, or they were singing about the the frustration and boredom of everyday life in mainstream society. Now, granted, that is a, a very broad painting painting it with a very broad brush, but the gist of it is. Uh, the lyrical content changed, f for the most part, from Baby, Baby, I Love You to uh, If I Have to Work at My Job Tomorrow, I'm Going to Kill My Fucking Boss. And I'm sure we, we all uh, have felt that at some point. Uh, since we've started asking questions, I, I'll take questions. Anything else? Don't be shy. I, I won't argue with you like I did with the, the, the woman at Grumpy's last night, unless you're wrong. Well, unless you're wrong. If you're wrong, I'll ram my, my opinion down your throat. Uh, Do you feel like the music from the other countries are also very stylistically similar, or are they pretty different? Uh, no, the, the bands worldwide were stylistically similar uh, in sound. Um, and that comes back to the two things of um, not being excited by the new ABBA record that was coming out, not being excited by bread. Um, <laughs> and I mean the band, not the loaf. Not being excited by the new Sugar Loaf record. <laughs> um, and the availability of cheap instruments. Um, had uh, Guitars remained prohibitively expensive, and tambourines and maracas been really cheap. Punk rock probably would have been tambourines and maracas. Uh, but because cheap guitars and cheap amps and cheap drums uh, played by amateurs who don't really know what they're doing all tend to sound the same, <laughs> then punk rock in, worldwide tended to have generically the same sound. Now, if you want to get into uh, semantics and everything, I can tell you the difference between, uh, you know, two bands that to anyone else would sound exactly the same. I can tell you why they're vastly different. But that's, that is, uh, you know, getting way too involved than I want to get into right now, unless you guys want me to. <laughs> um, sadly, I don't have any examples uh, that I could play. But uh, one funny thing to, to uh, kind of cap this all off, and I, I, another line drawn in the sand, punk rock in its original form ended pretty much by about 1978. Um, by 78, you had bands that were imitating bands they had already heard. Um, and that was the style. I mean, you know, uh, a couple years ago, The Killers came out, and how many bands immediately followed that sounded like The Killers? You know, 
that happens, punk rock or not punk rock, whatever's popular, uh, people jump on the bandwagon and ride it as much as they can. Um, but that happened in punk rock because it was it was such an explosion at the time. It was the thing to be into. Um, kind of like how hip hop in the late '80s just you know, people knew about hip hop in, in 1986, but it wasn't really as big until it blew up huge. And then all of a sudden, everyone is into hip hop who had, you know, never heard of it. Same thing happened with punk rock. And uh, so by about 78, all of the original energy, all of the original spirit, all of the original originality had kind of been played out. And the. Second wave, third wave had come in and just kind of bastardized the uh, the original intent. Um, and that happened, again, worldwide. Um, one thing, too, is that bands, the original bands, either stayed exactly the same. I mean, you can argue that the Ramones basically made the same record over and over again. They had different producers and different studios and slightly different sounds, but they basically rewrote the same album 17 times. Or you have a band like The Clash that stylistically changed every record. Uh, And so the original bands either became a parody of themselves, and I don't mean that in a bad way, um... Or they changed and kind of just, like, dismissed the whole punk rock thing. Um, and so by 78, you had all these these bands that were taking what they had already seen in the Dead Boys or uh, the Weirdos or X or the Germs or the Sex Pistols, and just copying that, cloning it, and not really bringing anything fresh or new to it. Um, By 78, you also had, um, from 76 to 78, punk rock opened up vast new areas of expression. Um, Not just in music, but in art, in fashion, in film, in photography, in printmaking, the the it was finally okay to do your own thing to to say fuck conventionality and just do whatever you wanted to do and so a lot of the bands that started in 78 um took the energy and the freedom of punk and went in completely different directions um you know joy division took the energy of punk rock and the DIY aspect of it but applied it to a different style of music. Um, The Talking Heads, who I mentioned earlier, did the same thing. Um, Blondie, one of my all-time favorite bands, did the same thing. They took the the energy and the excitement of punk rock and applied it to purely pop, like pop top 40 uh, sensibilities, and they became one of the biggest bands in the world in 79, 80. Um, and so, also by 78, you had uh, the beginnings of post-punk with, you know, bands like Bauhaus, Joy Division, um, Perubu, um, you know, just all these different bands. Um, and then you had hardcore springing up. Um, and unlike punk rock in general, hardcore is pretty much acknowledged to have started in California and the Bay Area. Um, And that then, uh, the hardcore explosion in the early 80s then went overseas and influenced a lot of those bands. Um, And hardcore became the predominant form of punk rock since the initial uh, 70s explosion. And again, hardcore is something that we could go into for hours, and I'm not prepared to do that tonight. (laughs) Um, but uh yeah i mean that's that's something that you know that that's one direction it went off in and the influence of punk rock as an attitude and as a style um is still being felt um 
it's it's really hard to convey how stifling mainstream society was in the 70s and especially now that we've all lived the majority of our lives in in a I don't want to say post punk because that's a genre in and of itself but in in a world after punk rock uh that we have the freedom to uh basically say fuck you to anything that we don't like and be our own person and that is that was the the main impetus in punk rock happening the first time around was people finally getting fed up and saying fuck this i'm doing my own thing uh sometimes the best things anyone can say is fuck off uh, that is punk rock right there um that sums up punk rock attitude perfectly um i think it's kind of cool because people that got into politics later in life or grew up and moved into more influential places in society they were still influenced by this music and listened to it and they brought some of those values and attitude that's, with them th- that's what i was saying about uh how he, he was saying uh for sake of the recording about how uh punk rock has influenced uh people who are in positions of influence um yeah if you uh if you go back and look at the political climate in 1975 versus 2012 it it, it was vastly different it was you know it was you know, we talk about the old boys network now and, and how the politicians, you know, just care about themselves. Uh, but really back then it was there was so much corruption and so much uh, backslapping and things like that, that uh, it's hard to, to believe uh, that it could be any worse than it is now. But, but you're right. People now, um, politicians, educators, uh, policymakers who have grown up with the freedom that punk rock allowed uh, are now in a position to uh, take some of those ideals and actually manifest them into uh, society now. Um, it's uh, someone just on Facebook today posted a, a picture of Brooke Shields and HR from the Bad Brains uh, smoking a pipe. And uh, you know, now if we, if we saw, you know, Lindsay Lohan and Snoop Dogg smoking a pipe together, it would be, you know, on TMZ for three minutes and then people would forget about it. At that time in, you know, 1980 or whatever, that was, you know, Brooke Shields' manager tried like hell to suppress that photo uh, because it just wasn't accepted. I know you have a lot of experience in the Minneapolis scene. And do you think that there's anything unique or special about this area specifically? The question is, is there anything specific to the Minneapolis scene? And the, the early, the, the 70s Minneapolis scene was pretty small. We really only had one band. We had the Suicide Commandos that fit my criteria of sound, attitude, and image. Um, there was a band called the Hipsters who still play every once in a while. Um, who were, they were basically a 60s cover band, but they amped it up, they sped everything up and turned it all up to 11 and just really kicked ass playing songs by Curtis Mayfield. Um, You also had The Suburbs, which were an early uh, Minneapolis band, but they were a little more refined. Um, They had a synthesizer um, and were just a little more on the new wave, quirky side of things. Um, so in the original punk rock explosion, Minneapolis, while we had a band or two, we were pretty minor players. We had a club called The Longhorn, which is now a uh, warehouse for Macy's downtown. Um, the Longhorn booked a lot of touring bands, so uh, you could see these bands that were on tour, they they had a place to play here. And I never went to the Longhorn. I was too young for that. But from what I've been told, it was pretty small as well. So you have to keep in mind that this is, even though it's a global phenomena, it's still really small. And it didn't, it didn't explode into the mainstream and become absolutely huge until the 90s. Uh, 
you know, Green Day, Offspring, Bad Religion, when those bands, Social Distortion, when those bands blew up, that's really when punk rock became mainstream and became a household thing. You know, your mom at least knew who Bad Religion was. Your mom knew who No Doubt was. Um, you could buy, uh, you know, uh, Offspring shirts at Target. Um, there, there was a time when you just couldn't do that. Um, but f- by and large, Minneapolis is a pretty minor player. But like every major metropolitan area, we had at least one band. Um, we had some bands that were trying and bands that were doing their own thing and were punk by association. Uh, but uh, the Minneapolis scene itself didn't really get, I don't want to say big, but uh, in the early 80s when hardcore happened, um, that's when punk rock in Minneapolis was more than just the same 150 people going to see the Suicide Commandos. Um, and then you started having basement shows. You started having uh, shows in park buildings. Uh, Whittier Park, just up here, uh, I don't know, about 10 years ago, they added on that whole school. It used to be just a little park building about the size of this room. And uh, a couple people formed a company called Garage Productions. And in the summer of, summers of 83, 84, 85, they brought a lot of touring bands into town and played in that park building. Um, so, yeah, in, in the grand scheme, Minneapolis was, was pretty minor in the beginning, but then once, obviously, Husker doing the replacements, and then later Soul Asylum got big, a lot more focus was, was paid on, you know, a lot more attention was paid on us, and, uh, that's when you had the, the big, like, Minneapolis band boom in the very late 80s, early 90s. All right, thanks. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. I'd like to thank Ali Stench for coming to Light Gray Art Lab and sharing a lot of his incredible knowledge. He's got a lot more to say, and we hope to have him back again soon to talk about a bunch of different topics. So um, be sure to check out the Light Gray Art Lab blog at blog.lightgrayartlab.com for upcoming workshops, classes, more lectures, uh, and, of course, our art shows. Um, you can find more from Ali at his website, theedgeenfanclub.com or his blog at hollystench.blogspot.com Before you were born